Well, good morning, Southside, and welcome to anyone who's visiting us this morning. We are grateful to have you with us. Those were beautiful baptisms. My heart uh, was full. Uh, I want to thank God for the freedom that we have to gather together, to worship together as His bride, and to, to give Him worship and have community together and to open up His Word. I pray that we'll never take that for granted, uh, what we've learned through this last year. Um, let's go before God and we will pray and we'll continue to worship Him through the Word of God. Let's go to Him. Father, I thank You for these testimonies of the new life. God, thank You that You're a saving God. My heart overflows with a good thing of where You've plucked them out. You've plucked them out from walks of years of sin and just um, four or five years of sin. God, what a beautiful thing that you save all types, from all places, all peoples. God, today we just lift up a Savior who's able to save to the uttermost all who draw near to God through him. I pray, let every heart see his glory and his beauty this morning. Lord, bless us and meet us now in the word of God. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Special thank you to Joel George for filling in so I could do my dad's memorial service and just focus in on that. And what a beautiful sermon he brought to us last week. So grateful for that, brother. This morning, we're going to take back up in Romans. So if you'll turn to Romans chapter 6. We've been laboring in this for a year. Um, Romans 1 through 5. If this is your first Sunday, I'm going to save you a year. 1 through 5 is that God is a saving God. He's brought us salvation. He came into this world to seek and to save that which was lost. And he sent his son into the world to accomplish this salvation. And he came to save us from our sin. And we learn in one through five, there's a penalty. The soul that sins must die. And God sent his own son into the world to take that penalty. To go up on a cross and die in our place. And now before God, he lived the life that we should have. And God can declare us righteous. He can declare us blameless, spotless before him, acceptable as children of God. He saves us from the penalty of sin. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And now we're in this section that God also saves from the power of sin, as you just heard. I love it. It's not just the penalty. He also sets us free from the power of sin that ruled and reigned in our life. And then one day he's going to set us free from the very presence of sin. We'll be saved to sin no more. There will be no more sin for all of eternity in heaven. Isn't that a good promise, a good hope? I like him shaking his hand in the back. That is good news. So it is a thorough salvation. It saves you from sin's penalty, its power, and its very presence. Praise be to God. for Name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. We're currently looking at how Christ then has saved us from its power in chapter 6 through 8. Chapter 6 is where we are currently. <clears throat> and we began with Paul asking the question, with such a free, gracious salvation, can I just live any way I want? I mean, just sin that grace might abound. Uh, isn't that a fair question to such a free gospel? And we've been looking at Paul's answer for the last few weeks, and his answer in the Greek is meganoitoi. May it never be. Don't even think that way. Perish the thought. How can you, as, as that last testimony I loved, I've died to sin. How can you die to sin and still live in it? That'll never be your question. You've been taken out of that realm. The question is, how can I never sin again? Not, let me just keep sinning so that grace might abound. That question will not come to the lips of a believer. His answer has been profound. Paul says, don't you know by faith you were joined to Jesus Christ in a union. You were joined to him in a marriage. And now his life and his death become yours. Everything he did when he lived this earth and when he died on a cross, it's as if you did it. You lived the life that God requires. And you died the death that God requires for sin. God will let him be your representative but also he becomes yours. You don't just get his record, you get him. And you're joined to him in a, in a holy matrimony. 
You're joined in a, a vital, organic union with Jesus Christ. A mystical union takes place. And yes, it takes care of the penalty of sin, but it also takes care of the power of sin as well. This relationship will one day take care of the very presence of sin. And I promise you that I won't keep bringing up my dad in every sermon from here on out. This is the last time. Hold me accountable. But it's just so fresh in my mind and heart. At 86, he was saved from the penalty of sin. And he finally realized that his good works could never set him free from that judgment. And he believed in Christ. And he was forgiven of every sin that he ever committed. And then the power of that relationship was so sweet as he just fellowshiped with Christ. He was being changed from one image of glory. I got to, to watch this transformation take place and it just made him so sweet. And then I watched that faith in Christ bring him right into glory. The, just the most joy I've ever seen a believer just walk into the presence of Christ. No fear. It just, Christ is sufficient, guys. To, to save from all those aspects of sin. Until the ransomed church of God has been saved to sin no more. So something mighty happens at your salvation. You're justified. You're declared not guilty before God. And you died to sin. And you've been made alive to God as Romans chapter 6. And remember we said they're indicatives. They're statements of fact. They're not imperatives. So you're not commanded to go make yourself dead to sin. You tried, didn't you? You can't, you can't kill it. No matter how hard you try, you can't. So you believe in Christ and you're, He did it. You died to sin. You've been taken out from that realm. And you've been made alive to God. I was a stillborn spiritually. I, I was dead to God. And by believing in Christ, He breathed life like Lazarus. Come forth. And He raises me from the dead. So these things are done. God did them when you believed in Christ. You don't have to go do them. That's the good news of the gospel. You believe something before you do anything. And so this came to me when I couldn't sleep Tuesday night, which has been a lot lately. This is so simple, but it, for me it was cool. Your sanctification, which is what you grow after you're saved, your sanctification can never bring justification. So changing your life and growing and going to church can never save you. But your justification, when you believe in Christ, will bring sanctification. It has to. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. So it, it will transform and change lives or you're dead in your sin. And some of you might have to deal with that this morning. Behold my favorite word, therefore. In light of this gospel, therefore, go live new lives. Amen? Amen. Thank you. I'm excited. I wanted you to be as well. So we're working through an outline in Romans 6. We're looking at five truths then concerning our release from the dominion of sin. In verse 1, we have an antagonist. Should we just continue in sin that grace might abound? Second outline, there's this axiomatic truth that is always true. How can you who died to sin still live in it? And now in verses 3 through 10, we've slowed up a little bit. We're, we're working through the argument and then I can't wait to get to verse 11, then the, the attitude of what you should do with what we're learning. And then in verses 12 through 14, the application. What does that mean today for a believer in Christ? And it's going to be very practical, very helpful. But Paul always says, knowing this, getting this first before you start trying to live it. And we will get to how this affects you day to day very shortly. So let's take up in verse 3, the argument, or do you not know? Paul brings us back to what happened by faith. You are baptized, uh, you are immersed into Christ. And I asked the question last time we were together when I was preaching, is this verses 3 through 4 a, a water baptism or a spiritual baptism? And, and I had the audacity to tell you that the MacArthur study Bible notes were not inspired. <laughs> and you know what happened right then? <laughs> At home, the live stream went out. <laughs> And many of you were afraid that I was hit by lightning. <laughs> and you were greatly concerned. But I just want you to know at home, we did finish the sermon and it's up online now if you want it. So let me clarify what I said or what I meant to say. <laughs> There's a big difference. This passage is all about spiritual union. 
This passage is that spiritually you were joined to Christ. That is this whole chapter 6. They're indicative truths of being baptized into Christ, no doubt. <clears throat> what I was proposing is what I think Paul's doing here is he's taking these Roman Christians back to what we just watched this morning, these baptisms, and he's going right back to your foundation saying, don't you, don't you know the very basic of your faith is the first thing you did when you believed is you were baptized. And what was your baptism picturing? The spiritual reality that by faith you were joined to Christ. And when Christ died on that cross, you died on that cross. And when he was buried in that tomb, you were buried what you were in Adam. And when he was raised, you were raised to walk in newness of life. That's what we just watched this morning. Baptism cannot save you, but faith in Christ, uh, baptism pictures what saves you. So the testimonies this morning and from every one of you sitting here that are believers is that when I believed what I was in Adam, and every testimony I just heard, I loved it, what I was in Adam died. I'm not what I was. And I became a new creation in the resurrection of Jesus Christ to live a whole new way. As one who has been set free from the bondage and all the consequences of sin. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone. What you were in Adam is gone. But the new has come, this resurrection life in Christ. And so I hope there are a bunch of questions because Paul now will take those two principles. This is where we left off, these two realities. And he's going to flush them out. In verses 5 through 7, I, ho I hope you're wondering, what does it mean to be dead to sin? Help me, pastor. That scares me. And so we're going to go look in verses 5 through 7 at a little more detail what it means to be dead to sin. And then next week, we're going to look at verses 8 through 10. What does it mean to be alive in Christ? So Paul will explain these truths deeper. So let's take up Romans 6, 5 through 7, that when you believed, you were united to Christ's death. Verse 5. For if we have become united with him, Christ, in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is free from sin. Verse 5 is the thesis statement of verses 6 through 10. It's, in, in the Greek, it's called a condition of reality. It's not if, it's since. Since you, uh, in verse 5, uh, have become united with him in the likeness of his death, and since you've become united in the likeness of his resurrection. The word united means to be planted together or grown together. It's an essential union. It's, it's becoming one. So what this is getting at is when you believe the gospel, we were united to Christ. And we're told here that we were united to his death. But I need you to understand this. You were not nailed to a cross or placed in a tomb, literally. Paul is saying that, that faith so united us to him that what he has done becomes ours. And it's as if we did it. It's as if we were there. You remember last time that old, that old hymn, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they laid him in a tomb? And were you there when he rose up from the grave? And the answer is yes, I was there. By faith, I was there. Child of God, you share in the work of Jesus Christ. He is your representative head by faith. So in union to Christ, you attended your own funeral. You died to sin. And you share in his death and his resurrection. Your marriage to Christ did something positionally that we've been studying for a year. But it also did something practically that we will study for a year. And let's see what the ramifications were to us then in day-to-day -day life. So the biggest key here, this was life-changing for me to understand verse 6. We've got to wrestle with terms. I need you to understand it. This could change your whole Christian life to get verse 6. Let's dig in to it. Knowing. You're to know this. You're to live into this reality daily. How many of us live into this every day? I get up. I'm dead to sin. The old self, the uh, anthropos, that, that old man that you were in Adam, that old woman, and listen to this, <coughs> was crucified. It's in the aorist tense, so it isn't crucifying it. It was crucified. It's dead. It was put on a cross. 
And so the context, this whole context of, of this is what you were in Adam. When, when you were born in this world, you had the sin of Adam and you were separated from God and by nature you were children of wrath. So all that you were in Adam was crucified. It died. And don't confuse the old man with the old nature. Our old sin nature has not been crucified. You still have sin within. Our lifelong battle is against remaining sin. That, that's got to help you a little bit when you hear the old man has been died and you're like, wait a minute, I still got sin. Our calling is not to kill the old man. He's crucified. We are taken out of Adam and we're placed in Christ. So we're not a spiritual schizophrenic. That, that wasn't me. No, it was me. That was me. That wasn't me. I know more people live in that way. That's me. That's not me. And there's two people within me, an old man, new man, just battling back and forth. That's not what the Bible says. We're never called to crucify the old man. We are dead to that old man who ruled and dominated us by sin. It's dead. In our context, I want you to listen to what Paul says in verse 2. He says, you died to sin. In verse 3, you were baptized into his death. <clears throat> in verse 5, you were united with him in the likeness of his death. In verse 6, the old self was crucified. In verse 7, uh, for he who has died. In verse 8, now if we have died with Christ. In verse 11, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin. I always love when people say, I wish Paul would just be clear. <laughs> You're dead. Okay? <laughs> Eight times. Quit, quit sitting here fighting and going, no, I'm not. Every believer died to what they were in Adam when they believed in Christ. I've ceased to be the man or woman that I was when I was in Adam. Isn't that the best news? I've died to that awful tyranny that I lived in. My former self is dead. What I was before was executed. And I died to that realm that I once lived in. The old man of self, what I was in Adam, that unconverted man, that stubborn and unbelieving man, that self-focused person serving the world with my lust, whatever it could dish out. I was devoted to sin and self-rule. I was blind to the glory of God. I loved everything in this world more than God's glory. Without hope and without God. I was under the dominion of sin and the wrath of God is what we learned in Romans. We're all born in the world that way. And I want you to hear this. That man died. Because of time, I want you to write down Colossians 3, 5 through 11. It's a beautiful cross-reference to what I'm talking about. So we are no longer what we were. John Newton, this is kind of a summary, but he said, I'm not what I should be. I'm not what I could be. I'm not what I ought to be. But because of Christ, I'm not the same. And that has to be the testimony. The church is jam full of people who say, all you got to do is believe and be forgiven and your life never has to change. And I'm telling you now, that's a lie from the devil. You died to what you were in Adam. You ever heard of the Augustine, 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 everyone kind of calls him something different. Fourth century, he was famous for his profligate lifestyle before salvation. And he was mightily saved and he, sh he shared, remember when we started Romans, I shared his conversion. And one day he, later, after being saved, he's walking down the street and a, mis a mistress that he once knew cried out, Augustine, Augustine. And he just kept walking as if he didn't even know her. And she yelled out, what's the matter? It's I. He says, yes, but it is no longer I anymore. For I have died and I'm a new man. So why would you ask, can we just continue in sin that grace might abound? If you can keep living like one who is still an Adam. Let me keep living the same way with the same lust of my eyes and desires of my flesh and boastful pride of life. Grace is too powerful for you to go back to be that person. And my burden is those who grow up in the church trying to keep a bunch of rules and they can't 
because your old man loves it and you just live your whole life in frustration when Christ offers you grace to give you this or you can die to what you were and have a new heart now that loves him and just wants to obey him. Isn't that better than grinding it out, trying to do all the things that you don't want to do? <laughs> don't, I mean, you're just, what a difference the gospel is than just legalism. And so some of you have been raised in the church and there's, a, there's a, just a bitter pill sitting on your shoulder and there should be. You need the, you need the Jesus Christ who saves from the dead. So then, what does my dying to the rule and reign of sin that I was under in Adam, what does it do practically to me? And I want you to come to verse 6. <clears throat> Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. And this is in the Greek called a henna clause. And it's the purpose. What's the purpose that you died to what you were in Adam? And the purpose here is that the body of sin might be done away with. What, Pastor? I still sin, and, and where you land then is I must not be a Christian. And what we need to do is we got to do a little work here in the text because this part's tricky. And so just think with me just a little bit. Paul keeps saying knowing. You need to know this. Paul is talking about the physical body. We're going to see where he takes all of this in Romans 6.12. Therefore, don't let sin reign in what? Your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And don't go on presenting the members of what? Your body to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. And so Paul saw sin associated with the believer's body. And so there was this bad teaching when he wrote this that uh, are, our ba are, our, are our bodies just bad naturally? In Hinduism, they believe that sin dwells in the body and the body is evil and salvation is death so you can be set free from the body. That's not what he's talking about. We've got to understand this. And I'm going to call in some heavy hitters to help us. John Murray and Martin Lloyd-Jones. John Murray says this of the body of sin. It's the body as it's conditioned and controlled by sin. The sinful body. And when sin reigned, it manifested itself in our body. When sin's ruling in you, it, it took your members and it used it for sin. It was the territory that it ruled over and dominated us. So our minds, our tongues, our hands, our feet, our eyes, our desires. Romans 3 again, we're just, sin used them. It just took control and we used our members to sin. Martin Lloyd-Jones says it is sin as it dwells in us in our present embodied condition as unbelievers. It was the body and the sphere in which sin and death still reigned in us. As we've been learning, it ruled in us. It's the same principle. The body of sin is that sin still rules and reigns over my body. And he's going to say that when you died, you died to that rule and realm, reign where your members were just used as instruments of unrighteousness. You were just the devil's errand boy. That's all you were. Here, take my, take my members, use them for sin. That's what we were in Adam. Sin dominated our body and our minds and our spirits. The body is the instrument of sin. And so it isn't that our bodies are evil and we got to get rid of them. It's what rules and reigns that we give these members to that we got to get rid of. And so this would include sinful instincts, bents, propensities, lustful desires, depraved mind, humanness. They all make up the body of sin which totally controlled the old man. It was a horrific slavery that to just give my members to sin, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't stop. That's what all of us once lived in, no matter how old. So what happened to that body of sin? I love what Paul said, that it might be done away with. Is it gone? Is it eradicated? And it's, it's an interesting word. James Boyce said it's that it no longer exerts a controlling force or power. It means to be made ineffective. So it no longer is ruling over you, that body of sin. It might be done away with. It, this word does not mean to annihilate. And that's good news because every one of us who are believers would testify, I still have sin. <laughs> and if this meant it annihilated it, then we got problems. <laughs> So it doesn't mean that. Hebrews 2.14 says, same word, since then the children share in flesh and blood, Jesus also partook of the same, that through death he might render, here's our word, powerless 
Him who had the power of death, that is the devil, he took away his dominion. The devil had power over death because of sin, and he could condemn us, and we'd be thrown in hell. So he, he, Jesus came and went into death, and he, he rendered him powerless. He, he's still a roaring lion. He still causes me problems, but he lost his reign over death. It was conquered by the resurrection. And so this word in the Greek, it, it means to deprive of its strength, its influence, or its controlling power. Sin is no longer sovereign or master. One uh, Puritan said it's a dethroned monarch. Its tyranny has been broken. So what you were in Adam when you were ruled and reigned to, to let sin use your members, that is no longer the sovereign of your life. So why do we still sin? Sin has been killed in regard to its complete power, but not its presence. The sin nature is not annihilated as we're going to see in Romans 7. In fact, now we see the strength of sin opposing it for the first time. I didn't even know what sin was when I was an unbeliever. And you get saved and you start seeing the power of sin that's fighting against this new eye that wants to do what's right. And so now this body of sin, I think it was John Owen said, is an angry, dethroned monarch desirous of regaining its throne. So it's dethroned. The monarch has been kicked off, but it's not happy. Okay? It's angry. And it wants that spot again in our lives. And it's, it's, it's remaining, but not reigning. And it just wants to rule over your life. And Paul's going to say, don't let it. And verse 12. Don't let it have that place again. It's done. This is real and a brutal battle against sin. One man said, if you're not killing sin, it will be surely killing you. And in Romans 8, we will learn how the Spirit puts to death remaining sin. So remaining sin, hear this, is not your friend. Sin has not been dethroned and decided to join your side. In fact, it will oppose and fight you to its very death. And the very sign of life is that there's a battle within now. Before, your flesh and your spirit were in agreement. And now, guys, there is a battle. But the dominion has been broken. And that needs to be the testimony of every child of God. Sanctification is more than getting over bad habits. It is no longer has dominion over the believer. It's been dethroned. It's been made ineffective from complete control. It does not control you as when you were in Adam. But now there's a new ruler, the reign of grace. And he will see to it that you have increasing victory over this foe. And that is why grace is not so that you can sin more, but that you can sin less. You now have the ability, I want you to hear this, you now have the ability to obey God for the first time. That's the freedom that little Piper talked about. That was, I think that was Piper. No, it's Tess. That verse you read at the end was beautiful. And that's it. We have freedom. And we have freedom to do what is right. I just want you to treasure that. Before that, I had no freedom. All I could do was serve sin. Grace enables us to obey God rather than disobey like we did in Adam. The body of sin lost its station, its throne, its dominion, its jurisdiction over our life. And I was going to save this for Romans 7, but I'm going to start here. It's a terrible illustration, but for me, simple things connect. I, I spray painted my house once. I'll never do it again. And you get this big bucket. And let's just say you got red paint. And you stick this tube in it, and you start spraying, and then you just get red paint real nice and even if you do it right. And then salvation is God now taking that, that, that tube and just lifting it out. What you were in Adam has died. And now I'm going to stick it in the white paint. You're in Christ. You have a new ruler, a new master. But when you start spraying, what's going to happen? You can say it. Pink, right? It's going to be pink. And the longer you spray, what's going to happen? It's going to be purified. It's going to get clearer and clearer. And so what I want you to see, child of God, man, you're not in the red paint any longer. I'm in the white paint, and I still have remaining sin that needs to be purified and growth the rest of my days. But I am not what I was when I was in Adam. So the body of sin 
is not extinct. It's defeated. It's not annihilated, but it's deprived of its reigning power. And that brings us to the third part of verse 6. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. And I just want you to see how perfect it all just keeps matching up. The unbeliever, I don't want to come to Christ and give up all my freedom is the funniest statement I've ever heard in my life. If you're smug saying that this morning, you have no freedom. You are free only to seek self and be miserable. That's all, that's your freedom. Yeah, you can choose your sin, go choose it. But you're a slave. You are a slave to sin. When we were in Adam, the body of sin controlled and dominated us. We were slaves to sin, doulos. That word when we began, that when you get saved, you become a doulos of Christ. But as unbelievers, a doulos was a willing bond slave. You, you, love, you love your slavery. So we, were, we loved our slavery. We loved the bondage of sin. Uh, we, we didn't want it differently. We served it eagerly, freely, unconditionally, joyfully. My frustration is that I couldn't have more of it. I wish I had more money, time, abilities. I could have had more sin. Thomas Boston said we loved our jailer and we were fond of our fetters. We just were smiling in prison and bondage going, isn't this great? I don't want to give this up. <laughs> oh, what is offered in Jesus Christ? Now, by faith, I've been joined to Christ and sin's dominion was broken. And I no longer pant for sin like a puppy. I hate it universal. I hate every form of it and I hate every suggestion of it. That's my battle. And so the, the, the St. Augustine kind of summarized this in a real simple, beautiful way. I meant to put it up on the screen, but I forgot. Before Adam fell, he said all we were, we were able to sin. So Adam in the garden, he was able to sin and sin he did. After the fall, he said, now we are not able not to sin. We're slaves and all, all we can do now is sin. And when you become a believer, he said, you're able not to sin for the first time. And when you get to glory, you will not be able to sin. The best a non-believer can do is sin. And the worst that a believer can do is sin. So this is what we call Christian freedom. We're free from the heart to do what God wants. Do you love this freedom? That's how you know that you've been born again. Do you love this freedom? Oh, what God has done for us in the gospel, we are no longer obligated to bow to sin's tyranny. We've been emancipated from what we were in Adam. I had an illustration that I used 20 years ago. So I'm going to use it again, and you're going to be like, that is so outdated. And most of you are going to say, I wasn't alive 20 years ago. Little Thompson family, just smile like it's good. <laughs> During the Persian Gulf War, it was amazing the strategy that the United States used, and they ordered airstrikes. And I just remember for days and days of these airstrikes. And what they did is they took out the control and command centers uh, in, in that battle, in that war. And once they, we defeated that, we could now begin to go in and, and take the troops and begin to rescue Kuwait. And the, the command and control center was our old man. That's it. And one act of Christ, it's defeated. And now grace in Christ is our new control center. And now we can begin the liberation from the body of sin. We're now clothed in the full armor of God and we can begin to battle. A battle in which by the grace of God, we will win. He promises that he will win this battle. And so here we are. The, the mission control centers are all down and taken away in Christ, but we still got insurgents who are fighting and battling against us within. But now we're going to win the battle because the mission and control center is now Christ. Man, what we have in Jesus Christ. And so verse 7, we'll close out. It's almost over, friend. <laughs> For he who has died is free from sin. And this word freed is the same word for justified. It means acquittal. 
And so we have learned that the act of Christ on the cross, he was judged for our sins and by faith we're not guilty. And we're acquitted before the bar of God, not guilty, and you can go free once the penalty's paid. And so we are justified, he's saying, we died to sin. We can walk out free from what we were in Adam. We are no longer under sin's jurisdiction for condemnation and for reign. But so many times, pastor, it just doesn't feel like it. But I want you to hear this. It's an indicative. This is what God did, whether you feel like it or not. Remember justification? Sometimes you feel like it and sometimes you don't. I believe what God's word says and you need to do the same thing in your sanctification. I believe this to be true. Don't you know? You don't have to bow to sin like you did before. Walk out of here. You don't have to serve it like you did when you were in Adam. Too many don't know that. I hear all the time in counseling, you think you have to serve sin. And the way you're going to get victory is when you know this and you reckon it to be true, I don't have to give my members to sin any longer. Sin is no longer the stronger, but it is still there, my friends. This is a war that we cannot lose. Mission Control Center has been taken out. And victory is certain because of Christ. And Romans 8 says, nothing can separate you, not even sin, from this salvation. And so we're going to lose some battles for sure, but we're going to repent and be forgiven and washed and cleansed. And I just want you to hear this morning, you who are battling sin as a believer, your, your victory is certain. He who began a good work will complete it. He will accomplish and win, and you will be saved to sin no more. So we are not rendered sinless, but we can sin less as the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that hymn says he breaks the power of canceled sin and sets the prisoners free. Your sin's been canceled in Jesus Christ. You've been justified. And that power is now broken and he sets the prisoners free to go live for him and to offer up your bodies a living sacrifice to God now to serve a new master. We're going to see that as we follow on Romans 6. I don't serve uh, the devil and sin any longer. I serve Christ. Here's my members, God. I give them to you. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Amen? Amen. Amen. So that's the application I want you to go out with, is I want you to have the, the victor's mindset and reckon this to be true, and you're going to find victory in this fight against sin like never before. So my charge... Who wants to join me in seeking to be as holy as a man or woman or child can be this side of glory? God's done everything necessary for us to grow. And so despite how you feel this morning, despite your circumstances that have been handpicked by God, despite the season that we live in in America, who wants to put their hand to the plow and not look back? from this union with Christ to give our members to his service and say, my cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. I had one in our midst quit last month and write me an email of apostasy. And I I don't think I could bear that again. I pray that none of you would walk away from your faith in Jesus Christ. So as a community of faith, let us use these members for the glory of God and not for our old lackey, the devil and sin. I'm no longer his slave. And now I want to use these members to advance the kingdom of God and make much of him. What a privilege to have a body to serve Jesus Christ. And these bodies are not to serve sin. He didn't give you a body to serve sin. And he redeems you so that now we can take these members our eyes and our thoughts and our feet to be swift in the gospel of peace and and to go and use these members for the king of kings. That's what this gospel does to a human heart. And any unbelievers who've come into our church this morning, whether you knew it or didn't when you walked in, I just want to offer to you the freedom that Jesus Christ offers. I'm an ambassador for God, and he's literally begging you through me right now, God himself, 
be reconciled to him through the gift of Jesus Christ. He wants you to throw down the slavery that you think is so sweet and come like the sweet testimonies we just heard and find the freedom of having your sins forgiven, declared right before God and the power of rule and reign of sin broken with the hope of one day to never have sin again for all of eternity. That's what Jesus offers to you. Please, be reconciled to God. It's the sweetest salvation I could ever tell. Let's pray. Father, I come before you and I thank you for this gospel. And I pray if there are any in our midst, God, right now, that you would cause them to do business with their soul before you. They can put their fingers in their ears and say, woo, I can't hear you. But every one of us are going to have a death day. And what we did with Jesus Christ is going to be the most important thing. And if we suppressed him and didn't see his glory and chased all these other things, oh God, what a day that will be. I pray for every soul in here that we have all come to that sweet Christ, the one who washes us clean and takes us out of our bondage and gives us a new reign called grace, a reign of a master who is so kind and patient, forbearing and yet truthful and serious. Oh, we thank you. We love our new master. I pray let everyone in this room have him as their master. And God, help the believers. Lord, and sometimes we believe that we have to sin. We get in patterns and we stay in them and we, we start to believe, I can never overcome this. God, let the power of your word through your spirit set them free this morning to get the, the mindset as I am dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. God, let them reckon that to be so in their uh, seat right here this morning. God, that they would walk into this world and know I don't have to serve that any longer. God, here's my members. Let me serve you and others. God, do that mighty freedom and transformation in every heart. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.